Hello everybody. Today we are looking at evolution and today we're going to talk about the mechanisms in which evolution causes the change in a gene pool of a population over time through natural selection. There are three patterns that we're going to look at today and let's dive right into it. So the first type of natural selection is called stabilizing selection and with stabilizing selection what we're going to see is that individuals within a population which of course has lots of variation you learned that from Darwin yesterday um, all these variations those that are kind of average or right in the middle those are going to have what we call the highest fitness now you might be under the mistaken impression that fitness is the biggest the strongest the fastest and that's not true that's not what Darwin ever said he said that fitness is that ability to survive long enough to successfully reproduce. So the fittest animal is not necessarily the one that's strongest. It's the one that survives and makes the most babies, the one that passes on the most genetic, um, genetic composition to the next generation. So when we talk about fitness um, and the average being best, let's look, get an example of that. Fishing season is about to kick off. I'm so excited to get out on the lake. My family, we love fishing and bass opener is like the best birthday present that I could ever get is to go out and just fill the boat with some monster bass. But I do know this about fishing. If you have a giant fish, like a trophy fish, that's gonna end up on my wall, right? I'm gonna taxidermy that, I'm gonna end up putting that on the wall or I'm gonna eat it. Small fish are also gonna get eaten because they're bait, like they're just, food for everything else. So it's not an advantage to be a really huge fish and it's not an advantage to be a really small fish. So an average size fish, I catch that fish, I'm gonna say, eh, not really a keeper, I throw him back. Another fish out in the lake is gonna swim past it and say, eh, a little bit too big, not worth my time. So the average sized fish is going to have the highest fitness. It's going to be the one that is going to be most likely to survive long enough to successfully reproduce and then pass those genes on to the next generation. So this is what that would look like in a graph. Here's a huge hint. You're going to want to study these graphs. You're going to see a lot more of those. That's going to be your practice for today as well, is with these graphs and examples that deal with these graphs. And you'll see this again on the test. So with this type of selection, you'll notice right here, we've got two areas that are shaded off. These would be the fish that were too small and were eaten as bait. These are the fish that were really large trophy fish that ended up in my live well. Okay. All of these fish survived. These guys died, so they didn't get to pass on their small genes, extra large trophy fish size genes to the next population. So over a series of multiple generations or after a period of time, what we're gonna see is that more and more of the population is gonna to start to look average. So that's one way that you can have a change in the gene pool over time, evolution. Another type of natural selection is with disruptive selection. And this is where both extreme variations have high fitness. So what you're gonna see is, for example, with owls. If you are a really dark owl, you are hidden against dark tree bark. I don't even know if you guys can see that guy. Um, I don't wanna zoom in, I might mess up my webcast software thingy, but the owl is right here. You can see his eyes and his nose and there's a wing, okay? So a dark owl is very well camouflaged. And a light colored owl, is very well camouflaged here but kind of a medium color owl or one that has stripes he's going to be seen everywhere and hashtag sad owl he's never going to catch any food because they're always going to see him coming he's not camouflaged he's not hidden at all on a graph that's going to look like this so the dark ones they lived the light ones they lived but all the medium colored owls they died off so over time less and less of those genes are going to be passed on because their parents keep dying so those genetics don't get passed on. The only genetics that do get passed on are the very dark, very light. So we're gonna see more and more of those in the population. And what you can start to see is that that population is starting to split and become less and less similar because that medium trait is starting to die off and not get passed along. Third and last example of natural selection patterns is with directional selection. And this is where there's only one extreme or only one direction that helps that population have high fitness. A great example of that is with the length of a tongue in an anteater. Anteaters need to have a long tongue to slurp up a whole bunch of ants that are way down deep in these massive ant hills. And so a long tongue is an advantage. A short tongue means that you die. A medium or average length tongue is also not a great thing. So on a graph, this is what that's gonna look like. 
all of the short and medium sized anteaters are here, they're all going to die off. They're all going to starve. The only anteaters that are going to be fat and sassy and happy and make lots and lots of babies are the ones down here on this end of the graph that have the extreme trait of having a very long tongue. So over time, we're going to see a drastic shift in that population, and we aren't going to see any on this side of the graph. They're all going to start moving one direction over to all having that very long tongue. I've got one last slide for you here to summarize it all. These are some real world examples, not just the ones that I make up and are kind of goofy. These are some examples here of stabilizing and directional and disruptive selection in the real world. And I will, whoops, yep, it's not going to let me zoom. So on here, what you'll see is a great example of stabilizing selection is the number of eggs that birds will lay. Typically, a robin will lay exactly four eggs. If they lay a lot more eggs than that, then they have to hunt for way more food. They have to invest a ton of energy into that. And it's not always a great strategy. Sometimes that's really detrimental for the parents. So laying a ton of eggs, not a great solution. Laying only one or two eggs, well, you guys have probably unfortunately seen this. Not all the eggs are going to make it. Some of them fall out of the nest. Some of them don't hatch well. So if you're only going to lay one or two eggs, you might not be doing what's best for your species. So the very best thing, the thing that has the highest fitness, is to stay right on that average of four eggs. There's also an example in humans that I don't have a picture for because it's straight up gross. And that is the birth weight of human babies. That is an example of stabilizing selection. You guys have all probably heard these horror stories of people giving birth to like 10 pound babies. It's horrible. It's a nightmare. But those really large babies, you might think, oh, that's good. That baby's super healthy. Eh, not so much because long, long time ago, before we had really great modern medicine and surgical procedures, a baby that large caused so much trauma to the mother that they didn't always make it. Um, sometimes a mother would die during childbirth with those really large babies. Other times that trauma of being birthed when you're that large can crush your skull when you're a tiny little baby, and that's not good either. So being really huge as a human baby, not great. So all the genetics that were being passed on for mothers to have huge babies, those got weeded out because those mothers passed away and those babies passed away. Okay. And then the same thing for really tiny babies. Maybe some of you know somebody who was born premature and was only five pounds, four pounds when they were born, those itty bitty tiny babies. Unfortunately, that's not always a great survival strategy either because they don't have all the body, um, body fat to keep them warm. They don't have all that built up nutrition to help them survive those first couple of weeks of life. So little babies died off, big babies died off. And now on average, human babies are between six and eight pounds, almost always between six and eight pounds. <laughs> Real world example here of directional selection, a very famous example, is with moths. What we saw is that um, when we had really, really beautiful, clean air in large industrial cities, beautiful, clean air, we had a lot of speckled moths. They kind of look like this one here on the left. And then directional selection, once that air got super cloudy with coal and factory fumes and all the tree bark started to get kind of stained dark, there was only one good survival strategy. It wasn't good to be speckled. It wasn't good to be somewhere in between. It all moved. The only surviving population were those that were dark. So what we saw was directional selection pushing all of them to be dark colored moths. And we saw that over the period of a couple of generations. And then down here at the bottom, disruptive selection. Let's say, for example, you've got a population of bunny rabbits and you've got pure white, you've got dark gray, and you've got kind of a medium gray. And these two are camouflaged, but the bright white, they stick out everywhere. So what we're going to see is that there's going to be no bright whites, and we're going to focus on the two that actually have camouflage, just like in that owl example that I gave you earlier. So that is um, our lesson today on evolution patterns with natural selection. And just remember and keep in mind that evolution, by definition, is any change in a gene pool of a population over time. And hopefully those three examples that I showed you are a good indication of how that gene pool could change over time.